So today we're going to go over property management and we're going to discuss the various property management assignments available in the property management field, the role of the property manager in each one, the essential elements of the property management agreement, right? We're going to talk about that, the various federal laws um, that the property manager should know, um, and the implementation of risk management procedures. So there's quite a few different terms we're going to discuss you know, like a cash flow report, preventive maintenance, profit and loss statement, risk management, routine maintenance, surety bonds, and so forth. So now let me ask you this question right from the start. Do you need to have a real estate license to be a property manager? What's the correct answer? Anyone? It depends on the state, right? Depends on the state and it depends on the what? The ownership and it also depends on what? Anyone know? What are you doing? So example, first off, if you own your own property, you don't have to have a real estate license, right? To be able to rent it out and manage your own property. You don't have to have a real estate agent's license for that. But what if, let's talk about two different scenarios. Here we are, you own this property, you own these 20 units, right? And you call me up and you say, hey, Rob, I want you to manage my property. And I say, hmm. I say, well, what do you want me to do? And you say, listen, every time we have a property available, I want you to go in there, clean it up, paint it up, get it ready to be rented. And then if all the other tenants, if they have a problem with their electrical or plumbing, or there's an emergency, I want you to make sure you answer the phone and let me know what's going on. If when I want you to make sure you're taking care of the, the, um, the snow plowing and the lawn and taking care of the properties. And then, um, you know, as people have questions and so forth, I want you to be their manager to help them out. Okay, so that's one example. Do I really need to have a real estate agent's license for that here in Connecticut? Probably not. And you no. say, and you say, hey Rob, I'm going to give you a free apartment and I'll give you a thousand dollars a month. I probably don't need to have a real estate agent's for license for that because I'm really kind of maintaining the property, right? I'm the emergency contact. I'm not signing leases. I'm not showing them the apartment. I'm not getting paid per transaction. Now there's always this gray line area. And if you were to talk to one attorney or the next, or you maybe talk to someone from the state, they would tell you, oh, you need your license or you don't need your real estate license. But I would tell you that I think it really depends on the ownership and then how you're getting paid. Because then if you told me, well, Rob, I want you every time there's a vacant apartment, yes, clean it up, paint it, make it nice, and then put the ad out there for the vacant apartment. And then I want you to show it to tenants. And I want you to help them fill out the application. And then um, I want you, if we agree to rent it to them, I want you to um, fill out the lease with them. And then I'll give you $500 every time we rent an apartment. Do I need my real estate agents for license for that? Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah. So you see the difference. So it just depends on a lot of different things. And, you know, if you talk to someone from the state, they might give you a different answer because I'm sure or most likely, you know, they're going to be leaning towards that. Everybody needs to have the real estate license. But I think it depends on a lot of different things, whether you're actually required to hold it or not. And so you have to be careful about, well, what are the actual tasks? What are you actually doing? Now, the thing with a property manager is that you wear many different hats, right? In one instance, you might be a market analyst trying to figure out how much the apartment should be going for. You might be almost like a salesperson or leasing agent out there trying to lease it. You might be an accountant doing a bunch of different reports, an advertising specialist, a maintenance person, right? And so there's a lot of different things that are, are your responsibilities. However, there's three primary or principal responsibilities for a property manager that the yellow book wants you to know. So what are those three principal responsibilities? Who knows? Do, do, do. 
So what are those three principal responsibilities? Is it to, oh, make sure all the tenants are happy? Achieve the goals of the owners. Gener generate income. For who? Generate income for the owner. Right. And preserve um, the increased value of the property. For who, pretty much? For the owner, right? So remember, you, and that was very good, you work for the owner. Your job as a property manager is to achieve the objectives of those owners um, or that owner. So what might be an, obje an objective? Who knows? What could be an objective that they would be looking for? Right? Maybe they want no more than 3% vacancy. So they want 97% of the units always rented out. Maybe they want to make $250 profit per month per unit. Maybe they want um, all the rentals to be over $1,200 a month. I don't know. I'm just kind of making it up. But you should know what the objectives of your particular owners that you're working for are, right? Because you need to know what their goals are. And then you need to make sure that you're trying to accomplish those goals. And it's going to be in several different ways, usually. And so a lot of this is dependent upon, you know, how big is the property? Um, how many tenants are there? What is it that you're doing, right? Because there are some, you could be a property manager for a, a single family house or a condo, or you could be a property manager for, you know, a thousand units or more. It just depends on the scenario. So if you go into the property management business, there's a lot of different areas where they have property management, um, um, different types of businesses. Could be corporate owners, right? So for some big properties. Could be apartment buildings, owners of small residential properties, homeowners associations. So that's usually pretty interesting. Investment syndicates, trusts, off, um, owners of office buildings. Right? I think it's, it's kind of interesting to get into the whole commercial realm of things. And so, you know, you know, as a property manager that you are going to have um, to work on making sure you have a good reputation and that you're consistently demonstrating your abilities to be able to do this stuff. And so there's also a lot of different new opportunities when it comes to that. So it might be, again, a community association management. You know, maybe you're that person that you're able to go to these homeowners associations for condos or, or, or PUDs and so forth and be able to give them a bunch of services that you're gonna be able to um, help them every step of the way, right? And so you probably would need a real estate license for that. And remember, your broker is going to need to be involved in this. You know, it's not like something that you can pretty much just do on your own. And most of the time, if you're a real estate salesperson, and you're making money off of a transaction, even if it's a rental or a lease, where does the money go? Do you get to keep the money? No. Nope. No, the money has to go to your broker. So you have to remember that, that it's not just, oh yeah, well, this is my little side gig. I do property management on the side. Every time I lease an apartment, this guy gives me $300 and you keep the $300 as a salesperson. Because here in Connecticut, you can probably get in trouble for that. Better be careful, right? Um, housing for seniors, right? And so that we know is a, um, a, an opportunity for you. Basically housing for those 55 and older, might be federal housing assistance programs and so forth. And so you might be responsible, you know, working in the facility, maybe there's housekeeping, maybe there's meal services, social event planning. I don't know, is that such a thing anymore? Social event planning. It's mostly like plan to go on Zoom, right? Plan to go, plan to go on your phone, right? It kind of sounds like sad. You, did you hear AquaTurf is closing down in Southington until next spring? They're not gonna do any more events until next spring. And they used to do like huge, you know, Christmas, um, winter events, New Year's events and so forth. Um, so anyways, housing for seniors though, social event planning could be a thing. Manufactured homes, right? So some of these homes might be putting on be, be putting on land where they're in like a mobile home park or a manufactured home park. You can do property management there. 
resort housing, concierge services. Um, where do they have concierge services, let's say in central Connecticut? Anybody know? Anybody have any, anybody in particular? So a big one, which is kind of cool is um, Hartford 21, right? Like I used to know somebody, he lived in there and we were in his unit, I guess I was gonna say apartment. We were in his apartment one evening and he was like, oh yeah, these guys love me. Anything I call them and ask for, they'll bring it up. You want me to show you? And we're like, nah, dude, that's all right. Oh yeah, you know, if I need a tie, they'll bring up a tie. If I tell them to go get me coffee, they'll go get me coffee, right? And this guy makes a lot of money, but he's kind of, you know, a hot dog because um, he was in the whole thing about um, financial securities and so forth. And that was, I started hanging out with these guys a little bit. That was the last time, uh, you know, had enough of that one. Asset management companies. So when we talk about asset management companies, what are those kinds of companies? What do they do? What does an asset management company do? I think of credit card companies. Anybody else? So, you know, really think about it this way. You have a big bank like Wells Fargo or Bank of America and so forth. And maybe they own certain properties. Maybe they have foreclosed on certain properties, which now they actually own, right? So does Bank of America want to make sure and manage the whole thing about, oh, making sure that the snowplow comes to all these different houses all over the country every time or making sure appraisal they have to order appraisals or making sure that these this house has been foreclosed on and the locks get changed and it gets cleaned up and the, it gets winterized and all these good things no they don't want to handle that in-house so what they usually will do is they will hire an asset management company that will be in charge of that for them and then be on point to uh, monitor and give them record keeping and so forth, right? Corporate property managers, even leasing agents, right? So those are all different specializations. Now we also have these different professional associations. I don't think you have to memorize these for the state exam, but you wanna become at least a little bit familiar with them. And once in a while, I'll get involved with one of these associations, which is, I think is kind of cool. You know, like for instance, I've been involved with the um, National Association of Re Residential Property Managers or the National Apartment Association. And every now and then they'll have, um, well, they used to, you know, have some type of meeting or seminar that was kind of interesting, especially if you're involved with investment properties. So you can take a look at these and they give you all the different websites for them. You know, and some of them um, will help you become you know, a better property manager if that's what you're looking to do. All right. So what is the main document or the first step in taking um, taking a new client for, for property management? What's the agreement called? Anybody know? The management agreement, right? What's the agreement called? The management agreement. And that is a very, very important document. That is what is going to create the agency relationship, right? Between the owner or owners and the property manager. That's going to have the duties and responsibilities, right? Because if you don't have that written down exactly who's going to be responsible for what, I can almost promise you that all of us on this, on this meeting, right? we have a different idea as to what a property manager should and shouldn't be doing. Like as an example, you might hire me to be your property manager for your three, this is, you know, you might hire me to be the property manager for your three unit apartment building, right? And then when something breaks, you might be thinking that I'm gonna go fix it. But I might be thinking, well, I'm the real estate professional and yes, I know that it's broken and I have this person who's willing to do it, who's willing to fix it for $200. But you see, that's a disconnect. That would be a disconnect between you and I. And so if we didn't have a management agreement, that could turn out to be a big issue. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Right. So we want to make sure that we have this agreement and that we have um, on point, what are the duties and responsibilities of the parties? You know, what is the description of this agreement? What's the time period? Are we doing it month to month? 
Are we doing it for a year, for two years, for four years? What, uh, what should the property manager's um, responsibilities be? What are the limitations? So again, if we don't have something written down, I might be thinking, okay, I have authorization, which I typically put this in the management agreements that I use, that I have authorization to spend up to $500 per month on maintaining or making small repairs to the property, right? And you might be thinking as the owner, 500 a month, I've never spent that my whole life. There goes all my profits. And you might not be happy about that, right? So that's why it's important to have those discussions. Well, what are the limitations or the restrictions? How much authorization does the actual property manager have? Is the property manager going to um, collect the rents, right? For some of the property management situations that I've been in, I don't collect the rents, right? The, the owner wants to actually collect the rents or the owner wants the checks, the rent checks going to a certain address, right? Um, who's going to do, is there such a thing or is there a need for payroll, advertising, insurance, management fees and so forth? How often does the owner want to discuss things? Do they, are they the type of owner that they want to discuss things once every other um, week? that they want to make sure that um, they're talking about things? Do they want to talk three times a week? Do they want to just go over a report once a month? So every single owner is different. Every single owner is going to have a different idea as to what they want. Does that make sense? All right, so reporting is important. Um, compensation. Well, how, are, how are you as the property manager going to get paid, right? Are you going to charge them a percentage of gross income? net income? Is it going to be a certain fee? Is it going to be a combination of these fees? There's all different ways in which you can do it. So it will just totally depend on what agreement you want to have. The allocation of costs, will there be, um, you know, especially if it's a big building, maybe they take um, an office space in the lower, in the basement, or, you know, maybe there was an old apartment that was never refinished in the basement and they want to turn that into, you know, the property manager's office. You know, and then who's going to pay for that space and how much is, are they responsible to pay? Who has the um, property liability policy? Who's going to be subject to the antitrust considerations and so forth? So there's a lot involved in there when we talk about the management agreement. So who has questions about management agreement? Anyone, anything that you want to go over with or discuss with that? <laughs> All right. So the property manager's responsibilities, that's going to be outlined in the management plan. There's going to be some financial reports, right? So it just depends on what each owner wants, how they want to use it, how they want to use these reports. There's not exactly an exact um, format that everybody has to do. But of course, your book wants you to know about the basic ones, right? And the first one would be an operating budget. And so these are good to good reports to kind of get used to knowing what they're all about, even if you plan on buying your own investment property, right? So, you know, you might have an operating budget, which is a projection, right? Looking into the future of what the income expenses are for the operation of a property over a one year period, right? And so this is going to depend upon the revenues and the expenses and give the owner his, his or her expected profit. Right. And then what you can also do is actually have um, an actual versus projected. So can you believe that, that you start your own business and you have a plan, right? And you actually, um, you actually project out how much you're going to make in the next quarter, you know, every six months in the next year and the next two years, you know, there's a lot of people that they do this sort of thing and they don't do um, an operating budget. And I think that's one of the really the most important things. If you're thinking or someone you know wants to buy investment property and you're not sure how to do it, just give me a call, let me know because we can definitely talk about it. But that's a huge thing. Understand what your return on investment is and how much you plan on making over the next few months or years. Right, cash flow report, right? Well, what's the current status every month Right, you should have 
um, information as far as income that comes in, right? Now, what are some of the ways that income comes in for a property manager or for an investment property? What are some types of income? Rental. Rent. That's a pretty simple one, but that's a good one, right? What else? Vending machines. Laundry. Yeah. Laundry. Laundry. Machine. laundry machine. Rent. Um, vending machines. Laundry. Laundry machines. I used to love. I mean, I kind of got rid of all the ones that I'm dealing with, but I used to be that person years ago that I used to love. Man, on Saturday morning. I would go and I would go to the um, laundry machines in the basement and get all the <laughs> orders. But then, you know what? Then I found out in a couple of my places, um, somebody was, uh, they were using like a fish string and they were like, you know, and there was some slugs in there and stuff like that. And oh, I used to get so mad, right? But anyways, I even found out sometimes you don't even make the money from those laundry, laundry machines if you have um, a company that supplies them. So here's an example. I have um, this one particular transaction where someone is selling 16 condos in like there's a 40 condo complex in New Haven and somebody wants to sell 16 of the 40, right? And so I went down in the basement and we were looking and um, the machines were beautiful, brand new, shiny washer dryers with the smart card machine and everything was, you know, mint, beautiful. I mean, they were lit with the blue lights and everything else. And I said, oh my gosh, I said, well, I wonder how much does the homeowners association and do the unit owners make from this? Um, because they're kind of like paying themselves. And she said, actually, what they did is the homeowners association made an agreement with the washer and dryer company that they would put them in there and that they would um, keep them maintained, right? And they would give them just a, a very, very slight bump just to pay enough for the cold water and electricity. But they don't really get money, like a, per, a huge percentage from the revenues of the machines. The company who supplies them gets the money. So it's kind of interesting the way every single, you know, maybe situation is. So anyways, remember, we have late fees, we have vending machines, there's all different types of income that's available when we talk about rental properties. Now, when we talk about expenses, we have to categorize them into two different kinds, fixed and variable. So what's an example of a fixed expense? Passes. What's that? The tax, property taxes and insurance. Right. Yeah. So these are things now, of course, we know it's not going to be exact every single month, but we can pretty much rely, okay, every six months, I'm going to have to pay about this much in property taxes, or every six months, I'm going to have to pay about this much in the, um, or every month, I'm going to have to pay about this much in utilities, right? So those are considered to be fixed expenses, right? But variable expenses are things that are usually, they can be recurring or non-recurring, right? But they're things that can change dramatically, right? So maybe one year you decide to put in all new bushes along the back of the property, right? That's a variable expense, right? Maybe the next year you decide to um, do a capital improvement by like, um, updating the basement for all new storage to make all new storage cubicles, right? That would be a variable expense. It's not something that you pay every single month or every single six months or every single year, right? So does everybody see the difference between um, fixed and variable expenses? Yeah. Any questions on those at all? No. All right, so cash flow. Now, when we talk about cash flow, right? We're really talking about rental income, any other kind of income, right? Minus the losses, that gives us our total income. Minus any kind of expenses like operating expenses, okay? So operating expenses minus debt service. So when I say debt service, what am I talking about? When I say the words, like it's, it talked about in your yellow book here, right? 
um, net operating income minus debt service minus reserves equals cash flow. So when we say debt service, what are we talking about? Anyone know? Your mortgage taxes, mortgage framing. Well, we're talking about principal and interest for a mortgage, right? So that always is separate because you see sometimes when people will, and that's in a different unit, we don't want to get into appraisals right now, but sometimes, well, not sometimes, but when people will try to understand the value of a property, debt service is not part of operating expenses because there could be 10 of us here and each one of us has a different scenario. One person might pay in cash. The other person might finance 75%. The other person might finance 50%. So that debt service is separate from operating expenses. Because so usually we wanna look at income minus operating expenses gives us the net operating income. But if we're talking about cash flow, we also have to subtract the debt service and whatever reserves that we have put aside to say, okay, here's what the actual cash flow is for this particular property. So who has questions on that? Anyone? Does everyone feel comfortable with that? So Rob, reserves, go with reserves. Do you mean as though I take my net operating income and then I'm gonna subtract a thousand dollars a month, whatever for my reserves? Is that what you're saying? It could be. I mean, yeah, because think about it this way. And I, I talk with, you know, I try to help out, especially a lot of new landlords. And I say, listen, even on a month where everything is great, you should be putting aside, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month in a separate account. Because especially if you know that maybe you have to get a new roof in five years or you want to make sure you're covered and you have money put aside as reserves for plumbing or electrical or insurance um, increases or tax increases and so forth. So yes, that there should be money set aside for reserves. Make sense? You know, but that's really the part about being a true business owner, like thinking about the future, planning for the future. Right. Some, there are some people, they're trying to run a business, but they're not really running it as a business. A true entrepreneur is going to be looking at their numbers every month and trying to understand how they can increase those numbers. Where are some of the um, where do some of the opportunities lie to keep more money in your pocket? Right. And to be prepared for emergencies, because we all know that we have them. Some of us live emergency by emergency, and that's really the worst way, right? Some of us love to spend, you know, consumption goes up during all the good times, and then all of a sudden, nobody saved any money for the rainy day. I mean, we learn these kinds of things when we're like 10 years old, save your money for the rainy day. And then, you know, some of us do it, some of us don't. So anyways, reserves is a real important thing. That's not what your millionaire book says. <laughs> oh, man. I answered that one. There you go. See? Yeah. But you got to be prepared. A smart business person got to be prepared. Right. right? Be prepared. So um, profit, right? And again, we talked about how debt service or your, your mortgage, how much you're paying on it is separated. So think about when, it, when we talk about a profit and loss statement, you're going to have the gross receipts, how much money is brought in, minus the operating expenses, minus your total mortgage payment, and that includes principal and interest. But then you're going to add your mortgage loan principal to get your net profit. So why would you add in your mortgage loan principal to get your profit? Because you're, you're, I would think it's because your principal is paying down your actual mortgage. So it's actually a profit, not a loss where your interest is a loss. Right, right, or an expense, right? So yeah. I mean, by you adding, buying down your debt, you're paying that debt off quicker, that's going to help you with your net profit, which Ron is exactly right on that. Budget comparison, you know, so that's important. So let's talk about the fun stuff about property management, renting the property out, right? 
So if you're a property manager and the, um, the, the owner says to you, how much are you going to rent these apartments out for? Okay. How do you decide? Now, your mind is probably going to one of these points really quick, which it you, does play a part in it. But I want also to, again, we're going to take it to a deeper level. What else do we need to know? So again, someone is the, the owner and they say to you, okay, how much are you going to rent these apartments out for? Okay. How are you going to, going to determine the rental rates? And this is what I, your yellow book wants you to know. Too. I would look, I mean, personally, I would look at what other similar properties are being rented would be one thing I'd look at. I'd look at location, accessibility to public transportation. I would look at, you know, what the property itself looks like, the condition it's in. Does it have laundry room? Does it, does it have amenities? Okay. In addition, all expenses must be covered. See, that's the big thing that a lot of times people will miss the boat on. That's a great point. And that's where I wanted to get to. See, here's the point. The first thing you should do is ask your owner, okay, what are your fixed expenses on this property? How much do you owe on this property every month? Because you need to be, okay, a, a solutions oriented. You need to give value. So it's easy to say, oh yeah, these apartments rent out for $800 a month. And let's say it's a nice little four unit property. They're all one bedrooms. You got four one bedrooms, boom, boom, boom. Oh yeah, in this area, they rent out for $800 a month. And that turns out to be $3,200 a month of income, right? Well, what if his expenses are $3,100 a month? What if his expenses are $3,400 a month and you don't know that? And you're like, oh yeah, we'll rent them out for 800 a month. And now all of a sudden, this um, owner who's put his faith in you is losing two, three, five hundred dollars a month. What are they going to think of you to, as a property manager? Terrible. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, if that's what the market rate is, then that's what it is. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, you see, you need to add value as a professional. That's why you need to come up with solutions. Okay, so can you rent out maybe the garages and make more money separately? Can you rent out storage space in the basement and make more money? Can you put in laundry machines? Can you um, put in new, update the kitchens or bathrooms and charge more, right? What is it that you can do for the owner? Because as a property manager, that's what we talked about in the very beginning is for you to meet those property managers objectives. Now, sometimes it might be really hard. It might almost seem impossible if they owe too much money on the property and so forth. But you see, just having those discussions with the property manager will show that you care about that person and that you're looking to come up with solutions for that person. And there's a lot of people that they own these three families, four families, six family, 10 units, and they don't even exactly know all their numbers and they're looking to you for that help, right? So, you know, according to your yellow book, what they want you to know is number one, the rental income must be sufficient to cover the property's fixed charges and operating expenses. And so you need to know that stuff first, right? So please make sure you do that. The rental income must pre provide a return on the owner's investment. You know, I had these gentlemen that they wanted to buy these other units. And I said, well, what are you looking, what, you know, they're asking me, they said, well, how much should we offer for these property, for this property? Okay. And I could come up with a number. Hey, I could make a number just like anybody else. I could throw a dart. Right. And I said, well, what is a reasonable amount per unit per month that you want to make for profit? And they looked at each other and this was just last weekend. They looked at each other and they were like, Oh, we didn't think about that because that's would be our target. You know, I mean, that's the way I would look at it or you can look at it, okay, what do you want for a return on your investment, right? For instance, if you're putting up $50,000 to buy this place, are you looking for 10%? Are you looking for 20%? Some people in their minds, they're thinking they're going to buy a three-family house and they're going to make a million dollars. And sometimes you're lucky if you're making 
$200, and let's just say in this area right now in today's world, and you're putting down 20% down, you're lucky if you're making $200 per unit per month because rentals are pretty high right now. Um, they're going for some pretty good prices. And if you don't know your exact profit, it could be really difficult. You know, so anyways, after you figure out, okay, what is the owner going to make? How much money can they really make, right? Then of course, yes, you wanna look at the comparables and what's going on in the marketplace. What's the desirability? What's the current vacancy rate, right? So I had these, these guys here in East Hartford where they came in from New York and they bought, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it's like 45 units or something like this apartment building, right? And this was like about five, six years ago. I'm going to actually say seven years ago, probably seven years ago, they came in and these rentals were going for like $600 a month. And they wanted to meet me to basically the agreement that we had that I was going to be basically their marketing arm. So I was going to go in there every time a unit was open, I was going to tell them what needed to be done, how it needed to be cleaned up, fixed, painted up, this and that. And then I was going to market it and rent it out for them. You know, they'll be the boss, but of course I'm going to market it, get the application, send it to them in New York, and then they make the decision and rent it out. Right. And so at the time, this place was like 70% rented and they were getting $600 a month. Right. And so they go in every time one was fixed, they fix it up. Boom. I would rent it out. Now, within like a year, we were up to 650 a month. Right. Now, two, three years later, we were up to because we, we didn't have as many of them available. Now, you might be thinking, oh, that's not very nice, Rob. You just keep raising the rents on people. Well, <laughs> okay. the truth of the matter is you are more than welcome right? You're more than welcome. There's a time and place for charity. And I give a lot of money to the Sunshine Kids for kids with cancer. You are more than welcome anytime you want to, to go buy some apartment buildings and rent them out for free or do a nonprofit agency. These people were in it for the profit. And what we basically found is we were up after like three, four years, three and a half years, we were up to over $800 a month because every time we put one of these units on the market, we had like 17 applications. So I was like, listen, do you know how many showings we're having? And I would show them, we have like 30 something showings. We have like a, over a hundred phone calls. We have like 250 internet inquiries and we get like 17 applications. If the demand is high, what are you able to do in business? It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You're able to raise your prices, right? Supply and demand. Supply and demand. This is a business related class, right? Th this session is business related. So anyways, and I say this stuff because, you know, past um, comments that I've heard from people, oh, you're just renting or raising the rents on everybody. Oh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm like, listen, man, if you want to start, start the church of apartments, church of rental apartments in this town, you can do that. It's, you know, I'll, I'll try to help you out if I can. But there's a difference when you're doing a nonprofit versus a profit. And um, so anyways, we got to- then the they'll just, What's that? I said, then they'll just get the state to help pay for it. <laughs> yeah, what the heck? Hey, and you know, every time that happens, who's really paying? <laughs> you all and I. Us, right? All of us. And I can tell you one thing, and it's not a political thing. It's just a thing as far as the way I feel. I'd rather have my money, if I'm going to pay taxes, First of all, I'd rather have it go to my local community. And then if it has to go to the state, that's still okay, even though I don't love it. But to have it go, my money have to go to Washington, D.C., so Congress and all those screwballs can take it and give it to somebody out in, um, um, I don't know. Oakland, Kansas City, Oklahoma. You know, Oakland, California. I, I don't really go for that that much, yeah. you know, so... Anyways, the whole point is we don't want to get way off track. Current vacancy rate is a big thing. So we started off at 70% vacancy. We started cleaning them up, marketing them nice, 
getting tenants in there that had no drug related issues, no violent crimes that we knew of. Now the place started getting a better um, reputation. And then before you knew it, those were apartments were getting rented, rented, rented. Now the way that it is, I mean, I stopped working with them like two years ago because it was just like, basically I, I worked myself out of a job. You know, I kind of worked myself out of that job um, because every time one comes on the market, right? They put it out there, they put it on apartments.com and boom, it gets rented out quick as hell and quick as heck, right? Sorry. And they um, they make like 800, they're, they're at like $850 a month for a little one bedroom place or studio, right? So vacancy rate is pretty important. Rental rates, of course, is pretty important. Um, you know, even when it comes to commercial, office, retail, industrial space, and so forth. They might even take a look at um, rates per square foot, right? Like take a look at um, rental rates per square foot for retail, especially malls. It's incredible that one square foot of space, like look down at the floor, especially if you have a piece of tile there, one square foot, people are renting out for, you know, $200. Right, so you got to pay 200 basically $200 to rent out that space, that one little square foot. Right, so it's kind of interesting the way that you know it can be real expensive. Like we talked about that property that sold in West Hartford just this past week, it sold for over $700 a square foot. I think that's amazing, $706 a square foot. Right, anyway, so that's really important. Um, and you know that if there's a high occupancy rate, right, that maybe rental rates are too low. Um, if it's the other way, maybe there's issues, right? Maybe the place has a bad reputation. You know, years ago, just a couple miles down the street from me, there was a reputation about one apartment building that they were having fires in the hallways. And do you think people want to rent when they know that there's been fires in the hallways? Right? Marketing. So marketing is going to be important as a, as a property manager, you know, making sure you attract the most reliable tenants and have a plan in place. Advertising is important, making sure, just like we talked about in the last unit, that there are no fair housing issues. You know, you have to make sure that there's no discrimination um, and that the property is going to still be able to attract the best tenants. Right. So who are the best tenants? What's an example of who's the best tenants? When we say that word best tenants, what does that really mean? What's someone, your... who don't... Yeah. someone who doesn't give problems, someone who pays on time, somebody who basically follow the rules. That's my opinion, the best tenants. And yeah. takes care of the property like maybe it was their own. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the way that you can maybe um, determine or select those tenants is how? It's a sad thing, but what is it? Past history. Now there are some of us, yeah, there are some of us that um, maybe our past history is not the greatest and we don't like to hear that. Or we think, well, that's not fear, right? But that's, that's the world, past history. So that's why landlords are going to look at credit. Right. Landlords are going to look. Um, have you had any evictions or, or um, housing violations before? Right. And so there's, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, and so that's, you know, you're, that's how you're going to be able to determine past history might reflect upon future performance as to who's going to be a best, the, the, the better tenants. Right. And so, um, you know, there might be a lot of different advertising methods you're going to use that your book wants, you know, like internet sites, of course, social media, of course, newspapers, probably not so much anymore. Um, you know, brochures, maybe, maybe if you're in some kind of like certain areas, radio, that would be pretty expensive, but you can do it or television, or maybe even direct mail, right? And so those things are going to be important. And it's going to be important as a property manager to understand, well, who's paying for the marketing and advertising costs. So it's different for everybody, 
right? Like I told you, when I was doing it for that 45 units, 50 units over here, where, you know, they, at the beginning, they only had 70% um, vacancy. I was the one paying for the marketing and advertising, right? And they were, and they were paying me every time I was able to fill one of those apartments. So it just is going to depend on a lot of different things. If you're an on-site property manager, you probably won't have those same costs. You know, you, it might be that it's going right to the building owners that they're paying for those things, right? And some of those things, believe it or not, can get a little expensive. Like, you know, some of those websites that are out there that are just for apartments, you know, that we see some of the commercials for and so forth. Sometimes they can get a little expensive depending. And so sometimes a lot of um, property owners, they don't want to use those, things, those particular services. Now, as property managers, we also have to be really concerned that we're going to be dealing with money, right? And um, when we're dealing with money, what do we have to make sure that we're, we're doing with this money? We have to make sure it's being put into separate accounts. It's not being put into our personal accounts, All right? I know what some of you are thinking, oh, man, I could be a property manager. I could take this money, use it for a couple of days, go to the casino, see if I could double up on it, and then give it to the owner. Ron, where did you leave the class? Oh, it's pretty quiet right now, huh? All right. So anyways, if you were to put your, that money that has to do with tenants and that is maybe should be going towards security deposit accounts or to be given to the owner and so forth, you were to put it in your personal account. What is that called? Who knows? What's that called? Anyone? You want me to play the song, don't you? Do, 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 do. No one knows? Can you repeat the question? All right. So if you were to take any of that money, that should be going maybe to security deposits or escrow accounts or to the owners of the property and put it in your personal account. What is that called? And these are co-mingling. So that's a very important term to know because that could very easily show up on a state exam. That's called co-mingling, right? And then the second term that you need to know is called conversion. And what is conversion that you cannot do? Use the funds personally. That's right. You can't use the funds. So remember, property managers have to make sure they're not using any of these funds personally, which is called conversion. Make sure you make a note of that and it's right here in your book under selecting tenants and or they cannot mix the funds into a personal account and that's called co-mingling. Just right. so everybody knows on that book that Rob told us to buy, there's about a hundred of those questions in one test. They really want you to know about that. Yeah. I was shocked, like almost every other, there must've been in the 50 questions I had, there must have been eight of them that had something about convergence and commingling. Yeah, it just goes to show you, maybe there's some of these property managers out here <laughs> using a little bit of money they're not supposed to be. I'm sitting there, I'm like, I get the point. Honestly, I get the point. <laughs> it's like, okay, don't use their money. <laughs> My gosh, it should be pretty simple. I actually get nervous when I get any of the money. I'm like, okay. First of all, I don't even want to take the money, right? But when I do have to, for one reason or another, I'm like almost holding on to that money the whole time until I figure out where is it that I have to do? Do I have to put it in the mail? You know, do I have a check that needs to be put into the mail? You know, what is it that I need to do with this money? Because if it's not my money, I really don't want much to do with it, you know? So anyways, pretty important stuff. Um, so again, when it comes to property managers, 
you know, you should have a plan in place on how the rents are going to be collected. You know, sometimes there comes an instance where um, you might not be the person to collect it, but you might have to be the person to follow up, right? And so in each lease agreement, and it's kind of interesting that we have this whole unit because, you know, we have another, we have another unit on just leases, but it tells you in this unit, the terms of the rental payment should be spelled out in every lease agreement, including time and place of payment, provisions and penalties for late payment and returned checks, right? That's pretty important one because, you know, all of a sudden you have a few people that are getting their checks bounced that they're sending to you. And now your account is being charged $35 a hit or whatever the number is these days, right? And then even provisions for cancellation and damages in case of non-payment. So hopefully you're going to have um, a good lease agreement that's going to have those things. And you need to also have a collection plan. It's not like, okay, you know, like one of the, it was a funny story. I wish I could remember exactly how we said it. But when I met Jeffrey Taylor, like 15, 20 years ago, this gentleman, he was one of the coolest guys I met. He was Dr. Landlord, right? He was Dr. Landlord. He was from, I don't know if it was from Texas area or where he was from. And he said, you know, he was saying, I hope you're not just sitting around hoping and praying that the tenants are going to pay the rent. How many of you hope and pray every day that the, you know, we're, we're with like 400 people. How many of you raise your hand how many of you hope and pray every day that the tenants are going to pay their rent? And of course, there were people raising their hand. And he's like, you're not going to make it. You might as well forget it. Because hoping and just praying that they're going to pay the rent is not what's going to bring in the money. You need to have a collection plan. And so I put together a collection plan for a lot of our properties that said, hey, listen, the rent is due on the first, right? So on the 28th, I'm sending a nice little reminder hey, just want to remind you, if you haven't paid your rent yet, it's due on the first. And some people would, you know, people get, some people get offended by that. Well, I have, I have until the 10th. No, you don't have until the 10th. The rent is due on the first. Now, because of the good graces of this wonderful state of Connecticut, they give you a nine day grace period. So that means I have to give you this 90 day grace period. But as far as I'm concerned, on the second, your rent is late. That means you're a late payer. On the third, your rent is late. That means you're a late payer. Can I charge you an extra fee? No. But if I don't have the money in my pocket, meaning in my mailbox when I go check the mail on the 11th, or I don't have it in my, in my um, account or it hasn't been delivered to me on the 10th or before, that means that now I can charge you a late payment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a collection plan that says on the 28th, I'm going to remind you the rent is due on the 1st. If we don't have it on the 1st, on the 2nd, we're going to remind you that the rent was due on the 1st. On the, on the 4th or 5th, we're going to remind you that the rent was due on the 1st. On the 7th, we're going to remind you that if you don't pay by the 10th, there's going to be a late payment and we reserve the right to start the eviction process, even though it's what we don't want to do. Because we don't want to do evictions. Right? We don't want to have to do that. It costs time. It costs money. But we have to remind them. And then on the 10th or, or on the 9th, you have one more day. Please make sure you're paying your rent on the first of every month. If we don't have it in our hands um, by tomorrow, we have to charge you this late payment. And we, have, we reserve the right to start the eviction process, which we probably will, because we have to treat everyone the same. Right? And once you start making deals with people and this person says, well, how come you didn't charge them the rent fee, the late fee, but you charged me? That's discrimination. How come you started the eviction process on me where it cost me an extra $300 to stay in this apartment, but you didn't start it on them, right? And you could think that you have this nice little business. Maybe it's only a two unit building. Maybe it's a two, a duplex. And do you think those two tenants, do they talk to each other? Yeah. And they're going to, uh, and they're going to talk to each other. And one might be like, well, he charged me and he didn't charge you and so forth. 
So that's where we're going to leave off for today as far as making sure that you have a collection plan. Where we're going to go for the next class is we're going to start talking about maintaining good relations um, with tenants. So before we kind of um, get going to the next class, does anybody have any questions or anything they want to go over? Nothing right now? Hey, Rob, that, I mean, Rob, that's Friday morning. We'll go over 19 starting at that, right? Relations? Yep. So we were going to start, we'll start at the next class at maintaining good relations with tenants, right? Which is part of unit 19 property management.